Okay, friends, welcome again to Theophology. Today's talk is 180 video of Theophology. Adrianus and I, we are moderators of uh, Theophology, are pleased to be accompanied by four distinguished guests with us. So let me begin by introducing our main speaker. Professor Hans Bursma is the Saint Benedict, Servants of Christ, Professor of Ascetic Theology at Nashoda House Theological Seminary in Wisconsin. Prior to coming to Nashoda House, Professor Hupursma served for 14 years on the faculty of Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, as the J.I. Packer Professor of Theology, a distinguished chair named after one of the greatest evangelical theologians who passed away on July 17th and six years at Trinity Western University in Langley, British Columbia. Professor Bursma grew up in the Netherlands and moved to Canada in 1983. He received his PhD in religion from the University of Utrecht, the Netherlands. On Nashota Seminary's website, we read that Professor Bursma, quote, has emerged as a leading voice among Protestant and evangelical theologians, exploring and appropriating the riches of the Catholic tradition. Professor Bursma's interests range across a variety of areas, patristic theology, 20th century Catholic thought, and spiritual interpretation of scripture. In each of these areas, he sets out to retrieve the sacramental ontology of the pre-modern tradition. This retrieval or ressourcement of the great tradition's sacramental view of reality has been at the heart of his publications over the past 15 years." End of quote. Um, 14 years ago, when yours truly was still serving in a Mennonite church in Kudus, Indonesia, and Professor Bursma was, I think, new at Regent College, the young Mennonite pastor wrote to Professor Pursma telling that he was interested in learning about the theology of the Puritan preacher Richard Baxter, about whom Professor Pursma wrote his dissertation at Utrecht and published a monograph on Baxter's theology of baptism. 13 years later, on March 19, 2019, when yours truly sat in a doctoral seminar class on Christian salvations at Fordham, at which the book Violence, Hospitality, and the Cross, Reappropriating the Atonement Tradition was discussed, I wrote to the distinguished teacher and mentor again, asking about whether his position on soteriology as described in that book had shifted. Only within hours that day, he generously replied to my email, sending along the preface to the Korean trans translation to the book, in which he clarifies his position on the doctrine of the atonement. Our topic today is his recent book, Seeing God, The Beatific Vision of God in Christian Tradition, published in 2018, a volume recognized by Christianity Today's 2019 Book Award in the category of Theology and Ethics, and praised by the Orthodox theologian David Bentley Hart as Theological Reflection of the most illuminating kind. The eminent Orthodox theologian Andrew Louth wrote in the foreword of that book that Dr. Bursma is one man ecumenical movement. And that Dr. Mm. Bursma exploration are invariably careful, fair, and immensely illuminating. So we are pleased to have Professor Bursma with us at the session. Dr. Bursma, welcome to our channel. Well, thank you very much, Mendio. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And our visiting moderators, uh, first is the Reverend Florian Simatupang, or Oyan Simatupang, who is now, who is no stranger to our channel. Currently, he is a PhD candidate in systematic theology at Regent University, Virginia. 
I believe that there is no better colleague uh, to be invited than Reverend Oyan because he, being a former student of Professor Bursma at Regent College, is also making use of Professor Bursma's sacramental ontology in his current dissertation project. And last but not least, two next visiting moderators are Abel Arwan, a minister at Emmaus Indonesian Christian Church in the city of Surabaya, East Java, and Carmia Margaret, uh, a minister at Hosanna, Emmanuel Christian Church in the city of Bandung, West Java. Both received their theology training at the Southeast Asia Bible Seminary in the city of Malang, East Java. Dear colleagues, welcome again to our channel. So without further ado, let me turn the platform to Professor Bursma by asking this question. On Regent College website, you said, quote, so much of this journey has been a personal search. A search of, I quote again, what it is God teaches us about the promise of the end time. We also read, however, in the Bible, there is a paradox of seeing and not seeing God. On the one hand, the Bible says that, that, that no one would ever see God. But on the other hand, Paul says that we will see God face to face. So what does the search look like for you, Professor Bursma? What does God teach you about Visio Day during your research? Friends, please help me in welcoming Professor Hans Bursma. Well, thank you very much again, uh, Nindio, for, for having me. It's a real pleasure and honor to be on your program. Um, you uh, reminded me of an earlier email conversation that we had about violence, hospitality, and the cross. I must confess that I had forgotten that. And you're reminding me. Um, and yes, I've changed my mind on a few things in, uh, that I've written in that book uh, as the uh, preface to the Korean edition uh, makes clear. Um, but um, we're not here to talk about violence, hospitality, and the cross, but about the book, Seeing God. Um, in terms of your question of what motivates me in, in writing the book and what it is that I'm searching for, let me first reiterate um, what you already mentioned briefly, namely that to me, this is a personal journey and a personal search, uh, much like Anselm, about whom I will say a little bit more later on. Um, for me, theology is, is um, an engagement with God at a personal level, and it is a search for God, a personal search for God. Um, an important reason why I wanted to write the book, Seeing God, is um, that I believe that God does hold out in the scriptures um, face to face. And um, it seems to me there, that there are few better ways to, spe to spend your time theologically um, than to meditate and to think about what it is that God's promise holds out to us. Um, that's an important personal reason for me to, to study this topic of the beatific vision, of the, the happifying vision, as Jonathan Edwards sometimes calls it, the vision that makes us beatus or happy, uh, the beatific vision. Um, another reason, somewhat less personal, but nonetheless important, um, is that it seems to me that um, contemporary Christianity is less concerned with the topic of seeing God than Christians have been in previous centuries. Um, we are at home in this world. Um, as Christians today, we tend to be uh, this worldly oriented. And I think um, a large part of that has to do with the materialist influence um, that we experience across the globe today, I think. And um, previous, Christians in previous um, generations have much to teach us, I think, both about the end um, that Scripture holds out to us, that of seeing God face to face, and also about the implications 
that that promise has uh, for how we live today and for how we search the scriptures today. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Um, but part of the reason, therefore, for this study is to recover something for today's church that I believe um, constitutes absolutely the, the, the essence of the Christian faith, namely um, the conviction that what God holds out for us is nothing less than union with him personally. That is to say, our theology, or my understanding at least, needs to be God-centered. It cannot be focused on anything less. It's not good enough, in other words, to hold out uh, something for the hereafter that is simply a continuation of the this worldly goods and, and, and pleasures that we're perhaps enjoying today. Um, if all we have for the future is more of the same, um, I think many of today's Christians and non-Christians who are suffering uh, for a variety of reasons um, will rightly um, will rightly reject this this form of Christianity. Uh, Christians need to learn again, I think, to be otherworldly in a proper sense, otherworldly. That is to say, the future that God holds out to us is a future of knowing Him and nothing less than knowing Him. Um, now, if that is the end, um, then that end uh, embeds itself, that end of seeing God, that tell us of seeing God, or my understanding, embeds itself already sacramentally in this world. So that already today, there are ways in which we see God. Um, now, the way we talk about ends is something that perhaps we should explore a little bit further. And the reason for that is that when you and I talk about ends today, um, particularly since the 17th century, since Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, when we talk about ends, we talk about ends as, as things that we freely choose uh, for ourselves. Or when it comes to uh, inanimate objects or, or, or animals, there are ends that you and I impose on these, on these things. Um, but for uh, much of the earlier tradition, ends or telloi um, are ends that, that pull us, as it were, that draw us. Uh, the language of final cause is important here. A final cause is not just a, a, an outcome, something that just happens at the end. A final cause instead is something um, that truly is a cause. It draws us. The, there's an appetite in it. Thomas Aquinas talks about both a, a natural appetite for, for all things that, that are naturally geared toward uh, the final end that constitutes their identity. Now, you and I too, as human beings, are constituted by our end, by our telos, namely seeing God. We have our true identity, our true humanity, uh, when we arrive in Christ. Um, at the end, which God has constituted for us. So there is a telos that we can discern, however dimly, in some way, sacramentally, already today. And the reason why that language of, of ends, and particularly the language of final causality, so that there's a natural pull, as it were, that the end has on us, that understanding of final causality is difficult for you and me today. Um, Francis Bacon, in his uh, 1620 book, Novum Organum, uh, writes the following. He says, a final cause, the notion of final cause is, and I'm quoting him, is a long way from being useful. In fact, it actually distorts the sciences, except in the case of human actions. Francis Bacon's experimental uh, approach to reality, um, his so-called new science, um, doesn't know essentially what to do with final causality. Instead, um, for Bacon, everything has to do with um, analyzing the objects experimentally that we have in front of us. Rene Descartes, very similarly, although from a somewhat different perspective, but in 1641, in his Meditations on First Philosophy, he writes, 
since I know that my own nature is very weak and limited, whereas the nature of God is immense, incomprehensible, and infinite, I also know, without more ado, that he is capable of countless things whose causes are beyond my knowledge. And for this reason alone, I consider the customary search for final causes, search for final causes, to be totally useless in physics. There's considerable rashness in thinking myself capable of investigating the purposes of God. Both Bacon and Descartes, each in his own way, discounted the usefulness of the notion of final causality. Now, all of that may have helped um, natural investigation, uh, experimental sciences, and so on. But what it also meant was it, it constituted a break in important ways with the Greek and Christian traditions. It is a break essentially between the appearances of the things around us, the things that we access through with the senses and the purposes toward which uh, they lead, toward which they naturally lead, according to the earlier tradition. A break, similarly, we could say, between the sacramentum, the outward appearance, and the race in Latin, the reality, their true identity, which is constituted by their end, their telos. There's a break between those things, between appearance and purpose or end, between sacramentum and race, sacrament and reality. The result of all of that is, for the theology of the beatific vision, the result of that is that it is no longer natural, or at least we, don't, we no longer consider it to be natural to long for the beatific vision. There's no longer a natural desire for our end. We no longer have a natural, rational appetite, to use Thomas's language. We no longer have a rational appetite for the beatific vision. Instead, we live in a world that is hermetically sealed off from its telos, from its end. We live in a world that we construct ourselves, and that is a world of pure nature, pura natura. And we've occluded, we've separated off anything supernatural from this purely natural world. Certainly we have secluded any sort of secluded ourselves from any sort of supernatural telos. So what should we do to recover um, the significance and the the, the um, spiritual importance especially of the beatific vision? Well one of the best things you could do is is essentially to read Saint Anselm's Proslogium, uh, a book that he wrote when he was still an, uh, the abbot in Beck in uh, northwestern France before he became the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and in that book, the Proslogion, he, he constructs basically an argument for the existence of God. That's what the book is mostly known for. Now, I'm not going to talk um, here about the ontological argument, interesting though it may be, Except for very briefly, for those of us who really need to know that argument, very briefly, the argument runs simply like this. Uh, there's a major premise, and the major premise runs like this. It's like, it's this. God is, and then comes the definition of God, God is that in which nothing greater can be conceived. That's Anselm on God. That's his major premise. God is that in which nothing greater can be conceived. And then he has a minor premise. But it is greater to be in reality than just to be in thought. It's the minor premise. It's greater to be in reality than just in thought. From those two premises, he then draws the conclusion, therefore, God exists in reality. God exists. That's his ontological argument. Now, Anselm, throughout this book, searches for this God, this God whom he rationally argues exists, is the God whom he wants to experience, know, and see. He searches throughout the book by way of a sort of natural appetite, a rational natural appetite. I was created 
to see thee, he writes, and not yet have I done that for which I was made. Throughout the book, he engages in a prayerful search. He addresses God directly, he speaks to God. This is not actually an abstract, purely natural argument. What Anselm constructs in this book is a prayerful argument, a prayerful search for God. He aims at contemplation. That's the ultimate summit for which he longs. Contemplation in this life is a, is a foreshadowing of the eternal beatific vision of God. In the introduction to the book, he writes this. It's a book that is, 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 is meant to be meditated upon. Anselm also wrote many prayers and, and meditations. And this book, like those prayers and meditations, is meant to be read slowly, uh, is meant to be read repeatedly, is meant to be meditated upon, just like we meditate on the scriptures. And so in the introduction, he writes this, enter the inner chamber of thy mind, shut out all thoughts, save that of God, accept that of God, and such as can aid thee in seeking him. Close thy door and seek him. Speak now, my whole heart. Speak now to God, saying, I seek thy face, thy face, Lord, will I seek. This is Psalm 28, 27, verse 8. And come thou now, O Lord my God, teach my heart where and how it may seek thee, where and how it may find thee. You see what he's setting out to do? He's searching for God. He wants, with the psalmist, with David in Psalm 27, he wants to see God. I seek thy face, thy face, Lord, will I seek. At times he seems, Anselm seems almost to despair of ever seeing God. There is this gap that we also see in modernity, or almost this gap that we see in modernity with Bacon and with Descartes. But on different premises for different reasons. And the reason for Anselm is a theological one. God lives, as um, we were reminded already by Nandio in the introduction, God lives in unapproachable light, 1 Timothy 6, 16. So how can we see him? Who shall lead me to that light and into it that I may seek thee or that I may see thee in it? He asks. And a little later, I have never seen thee, O Lord my God. I don't know thy form. What, O most high Lord, shall this man do? An exile far from thee. Anselm senses, experiences himself as far from God. He does not see God. God doesn't show his face, doesn't show his form. And yet, the gap between appearance and end, between sacrament and reality, is not a gulf. It's not a chasm. Is if the gap is not complete, why not? Essentially because the form of this meditation, of the proslogium, is the form of prayer. Mm. Anselm knows himself from beginning to end, dependent on God's revelation. We see only, we see God only, the light of God, only if God first shines on us. Anselm says, Again in prayer, teach me to seek thee and reveal thyself to me. Again, a little later, give me, so far as thou knowest it to be profitable, to understand that thou art as we believe. Anselm is dependent on God to come down to him, to show his light to him. And so he then gives his definition of God as that in which nothing greater can be conceived. It's not a purely rational argument about what God is like, who he is. Instead, what Anselm does here is he confesses that God transcends everything earthly and is ultimately incomprehensible. Therefore, we need divine revelation. We need God to stoop down, as it were. Anselm's reasons, the rational argument that he gives, are reasons that are constructed within the relationship that he already has with God. God is already, is already in some manner shining upon him, revealing himself to him, so that he, Anselm, as a believer, 
knows that he is longing, desiring for God, and thereby fulfilling his natural calling. The proslogion essentially, you could say, from beginning to end, is a mystical handbook. It's a handbook that is meant, as, as, as Anselm himself puts it, to lead to the contemplation of God, at contemplandum deum. The goal, the purpose is the beatific vision. There's no pure reason here. There's no pure nature here. God's light, the divine light of revelation, always already, the end, the telos, always already shines into our lives so that it is from that beginning of, of experience that God gives to us, we can reach out and ask for God to reveal himself more clearly. Yesterday and today and tomorrow, writes Anselm, have no existence except in time, but thou, although nothing exists without thee, nevertheless, thou dost not exist in time or space, but all things exist in thee. All things exist in thee. For nothing contains thee, but thou containest all. You see, for, for Anselm, all of creation participates in God's being. Anselm is a deeply participatory thinker. And because, and inasmuch as all creation participates in God, it participates in its end. So that the end already in some manner is present here and now. The ontological argument makes no sense except from within um, the experience of, of knowing that God makes himself present to all of creation, including to Anselm himself. But there is a deep underlying sense that Anselm worries in this book. It's not, not just worries, almost despairs of, of, of not being able to overcome his blindness. Um, within this relationship with God that he senses somehow is present, he prays for more light. He writes, for example, I tried to, I tried to rise to the light of God and I've fallen back into my darkness. Very Augustinian theme. Think of the book of the Confessions, chapters, uh, book seven. I tried to rise to the light of God and I've fallen back into my darkness. And, the, and again, a little bit later on, do thou help me for thy goodness sake. Lord, I sought thy face. Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Again, he's quoting Psalm 27. Now much further on in, in the uh, proslogium. Hide not thy face far from me. And then he goes on, free me from myself toward thee. Cleanse, heal, sharpen, enlighten the eye of my mind that it may behold thee. Let my soul recover its strength and with all its understanding, let it strive toward thee. What art thou, Lord? What art thou? What shall my heart conceive thee to be? Anselm knows that God is, you could say. He knows that God exists. He never doubts it through all his argument. But he wants to know what God is. He wants to see the form of God. And at that point, he recognizes that the very definition that he has given of God, that than which nothing greater can be conceived, that that definition is inadequate. Here comes a, a, what I think of as an as absolutely central moment in, uh, in Anselm's Proslogion, when he writes, Therefore, O Lord, thou art not only that than which a greater cannot be conceived, the very definition he gave earlier, but he then goes on, thou art something greater than can be conceived. You see what he's doing here? We can come up with all sorts of things in our mind, but that which with that with which you and I come up is not God. If you have thought it, Augustine already said, it is not God. God is greater than our thoughts, greater than can be conceived. And that is why our search for God, our search for seeing God, is a search that propels itself further and further and further 
because there's always a, more of God to be seen and to be discovered. Only in heaven, for St. Anselm, only in heaven will there be fullness of understanding, joy, and love. And that's what he writes on in the, the last three chapters, 24, 25, and 26 of, uh, of the Prologium. There in heaven um, will our longing finally be, fu be fulfilled. Only there will that gap that, that now separates us in some manner from God be overcome. As uh, one Anselm scholar puts it, Gavin Ortland, the reason we cannot comprehend the extent of the joy of heaven is that in this life, we cannot yet comprehend how much we will know and love God there. Can't comprehend the joy of heaven. We cannot comprehend God, that is, because it's incomprehensible to us how much we will know and love God then. Anselm's argument, the ontological argument for the existence of God is an argument that is meant to persuade. And indeed throughout the book, we see Anselm in a persuasive mode, writing to monks in his own day, and writing to you and me today about contemplation of God. It's not an argument grounded strictly in reason. If by reason we mean pure reason, if by reason we mean a reason that is separated from any prior theological or Christological commitments, Anselm does not present an argument such as that. Never does the abbot of Beck leave behind his love of God, his longing for God, his deep desire to know this God more and to know him ultimately face to face. He constructs a rational argument to be sure, but it is an argument that makes sense only within faith. It is, as Anselm himself puts it, faith seeking understanding. And secondly, neither does Anselm move toward a more postmodern view that would see persuasion as pure rhetoric, as an appeal to pure aesthetics. Now, aesthetics are important. Beauty is important to Anselm, very important, as we've already noticed, if we've, if we've listened carefully to the um, quotations that I've given to you from Anselm. Anselm is deeply concerned with harmony uh, in his uh, book on atonement, uh, Cur Deus Homo. His entire argument is structured around the fittingness, the, 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 the harmony, the beauty, of, uh, of, of a properly ordered universe. And Anselm's writing reflects that. Uh, beauty is important to him also in language. And he uses, therefore, just as he uses reason, so he also uses rhetoric to persuade. But also Anselm's rhetoric lies embedded um, within the prior conviction that God is truly drawing him. The God is not a construct of the mind. The God is not something that we need in order to cope with reality, but the God truly stands there welcoming him as the end, the God who is the end in Christ, welcoming him. How does Anselm know? Because he has seen something of this God already in this life. The doctrine of the beautiful vision in an Anselmian mode then recognizes that despite the presence of some kind of gap always in this life, nonetheless, God himself, the telos, the purpose, the end is already sacramentally present in this life in a variety of ways. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A. But God already makes himself present 
in a variety of experiences in this life. And in as much as we recognize God today, we have a foretaste of a vision of God face to face in the hereafter. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Bursma, for such a beautiful presentation, such an enlightening uh, for us, so that we have some broad overview of the first chapter of your book. Uh, thank you. I'm still curious, though, uh, about your trajectory, because as I mentioned earlier, you wrote uh, on Richard Baxter, and now you came to the more platonic uh, notion of reality or theology. Uh, would you mind uh, giving us uh, some explanation about the trajectories that you have gone through yes, to this course. point? Yes, of course. Yes, I wrote my dissertation on Richard Baxter on the doctrine of justification in, in Richard Baxter. Um, and um, it's true that um, in most of my subsequent writing, um, I've, I've moved away from the Puritans and I've uh, engaged more the um, patristic and medieval traditions, especially the patristic tradition. And um, to cut a long story short, um, the, the reason is that when I started teaching theology at Trinity Western University, um, I discovered Nouvelle Theologie. I discovered the, the new theologians, Catholic theologians of the mid 20th century, in particular, uh, Yves Congar um, and his writing on tradition, and Henri de Lubac and his writing on patristic and medieval exegesis. What Congar taught me was that, uh, is that um, scripture and tradition um, are interrelated, are interwoven, and that they cannot be separated the one from the other. Uh, that was a blow to my Calvinist convictions, even though Kungara was somebody who had a lot of sympathy in some ways with, with the Protestant tradition. Um, and it made me re, re look at the tradition and take the tradition more seriously. Um, the Lubac was particularly an eye opener, even more so than, than Kungar for me. Um, I had been trained in seminary with a redemptive historical uh, method of, of interpreting scripture that was interested primarily in authorial intent and in the intent of the author. And um, through the Lubac, I came to, I, I became acquainted with the way in which the church fathers read scripture, typologically, allegorically, in ways that make our hair stand up straight, perhaps, and make us think, what in the world is going on here? Uh, I made a decision fairly early on that these church fathers are at least were at least as bright as I am, and I cannot simply ignore them or or, or read them just out of historical interest. I, I have to take them seriously. Um, and um, doing that, I came to recognize that what they did in their interpretation of scripture um, is, is, is basically what the same thing that drove them to, to take the beatific vision as seriously as they did in both their understanding of the beatific vision and in their reading of scripture. They were after the face of God. They were searching for God in Jesus Christ. And so... Um, they were less interested in scientifically understanding um, what the authors may or may not have meant um, than they were in, in, in trying to find Jesus in the scriptures. Um, allegory is basically, on my understanding at least, allegory uh, properly done is basically uh, looking for the other alos, for the other meaning, that is to say for the Christological uh, meaning and implications of, of the biblical text. So uh, I, I came to, to, I discovered Nouvelle Theologie and through Nouvelle Theologie, I came to discover the 20th century Catholic thought more broadly 
and uh, via uh, the Nouvelle theologians of the 20th century, uh, who in their own day were engaged in a retrieval project of sorts. Um, I came to a retrieval myself of, of the church fathers and fell in love with them. Um, that meant indeed a much more Christian Platonist understanding of the tradition and of, of how to, uh, Christian Platonist understanding of how to do theology than I had known. And for a long time, I did not engage the Puritans, but if you've looked in the uh, in the book, Seeing God Carefully, you will see that uh, I've done for the first time in many years some, some reading again of the Puritans. Because in many ways, actually, uh, there, there is a side to the Puritans. I'm, I must confess, I'm not much of a Calvinist. That, that's, that's, you know, the five points of Calvinism are, aren't my favorite points, as it were. But but there, there are things in the Puritans, as, as, as in Jonathan Edwards, a later Puritan perhaps, there are things in the Puritans um, that, that, um, um, that are very sympathetic to patristic concerns. Um, for example, allegorical interpretation is not just there in the, in the Church Fathers, it is there all over the place in Puritanism. Um, the concern for meditation is there in Baxter, is there in Owen, uh, meditation and contemplation. These, these, these um, um, meditative and also ascetical concerns of the Puritans um, stand in a long tradition and, and, and were in a way a retrieval of patristic and of medieval practices and, 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 and approaches um, that the Puritans tried to recover. Um, the centrality of the doctrine of the beatific vision in the Puritans is, is one aspect, I think, that fits with this Christian Platonist vision of reality, this sacramental vision of reality. Um, one aspect that um, the Puritans um, have in common with the Church Fathers, uh, in some cases, they take it directly from the Father. Sometimes um, it is a mediated, um, mediated presence of these of these themes in the Puritans. Um, but reading and rereading um, uh, people such as Thomas Watson, Isaac Ambrose, John Owen, and so on for this book, Seeing God, was an absolute delight. It's in some ways like you're reading the Church Fathers. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, related to that question, before I turn uh, the time to my colleagues here, uh, Arfin asked uh, about your book, the Oxford book on sacramental ontology and new well theology. What distinguishes your sacramental theology from the views of the resource mall thinkers? Yeah, thank you for that, Arvin. Um, I'm not sure that it's that much different, really. Um, Maybe the best way to put it is that what I tried to do in seeing God um, is to apply the, the, the sacramental ontology that I'm convinced lies at the heart of Nouvelle Theologie, to apply that to the beatific vision. My sacramental understanding of reality, participatory ontology, sacramental ontology, whatever you want to call it, is deeply grounded in Nouvelle Theologie. And in particular, I would say Henri de Lubac. I, I, he's, he's my very, he's my favorite of the of the Nouvelle theologians. Um, is it, is deeply grounded in them. Um, and the way I talk about teleology, um, I have I don't take that directly from the Nouvelle theologians, but as I came to think of the beatific vision and, and of how to understand the beatific vision sacramentally, I recognize that, that you have to understand it or, or construct it or whatever, you have, whatever term you want to use. You have to understand it um, as in terms of the relationship between sacrament and reality, sacramental and race. And, and you have to, again, join together just as the developed theologians were concerned to do you have to join together again nature and the supernatural. Well, how do you do that with the doctrine of the beatific vision? Well, you think of what we experience here in this life and what we will experience in the hereafter. And then how do we navigate that quote unquote gap that I talked about in the introductory notes, in the introductory comments? 
And the way to do that, I think, is to say, well, the end is already present. So we need to recover an earlier understanding also of teleology. That's not something, to my knowledge at least, it's not something that the, sacrament, that the uh, novel theologians themselves did. But I think that what I'm doing in this book is, is in line with, with, um, with their understanding of reality. Thank you. The floor is yours, my friends. All right, any questions? Uh, from the yes. moderators? Please. Okay. <laughs> so, um, 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 yeah, I want to first of all share a testimony uh, that I shared to uh, Nindyo earlier to the audience as well. That as a good a biblical Pentecostal in my early years in Regent College, um, I used to like dislike whatever Professor Borsma was saying. <laughs> Until I actually explore my Pentecostalism and I crossed the Rubicon and I can't say enough about sacramental ontology. And so in 2016, I actually wrote him an email and say, uh, Father, bless me before I have sinned. And he graciously forgive me. <laughs> and uh, interestingly, that the journey that I had was similar to when, you know, he explained his journey. Uh, he mentioned about um, Yves Congar uh, and I think the 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 book uh, was The Meaning of Tradition, um, where you know he was quoting Max Turia and saying that tradition is a thus a universal ecumenical reading of scripture by the church in light of the Holy Spirit. And that was after I read um, Heavenly Participation uh, that uh, Professor Borsma wrote. And I was like, this is Pentecostalism because we have text, community, and spirit. And so um, that's where the journey begins. And uh, if there were ever going to be a the theology of Hans Bursma, I hope I can contribute to that one day. <laughs> My question is, uh, Professor Bursma, um, um, at one point where I was exploring this beatific vision, um, uh, and um, you know, because the beatific vision uh, focused so much on the telos, uh, I, I proposed uh, some ideas uh, to a professor uh, that taught uh, the theology of beauty uh, where I was doing my coursework. And um, you know, he said, um, be careful with beatific vision because there are some scholastic assumptions that you might not be uh, comfortable with. He said, stick with analogia entis because uh, for Pentecostals, it, um, it is an intellectual and spiritual doorway to the miraculous. Um, you know, it sensitizes us, it makes us, it makes visible to us the absolute uncanniness uh, of existence, basically, that's what he said. And um, uh, I thought that I, you know, um, I think uh, only sticking with um, analogia entis without uh, going into beatific vision. I think for Pentecostals, we might uh, not push it far enough that um, uh, to a point where there's something that safeguards us against an overly realized eschatology, as you know we you know that we have often fallen to. Um, uh, do you have something to say um, uh, in in light of that? Um, am I uh, you know, going in a some kind of a right direction, um, not yeah. push, um, yeah, pushing um, that I need to push more towards a beatific vision than just sticking to an analogy entis. Yeah, thank you for that. It's a great question. Uh, let me first confirm what what you're saying about the similarity between um, Pentecostalism and charismatic movement and, um, and the participatory ontology. Of, of the tradition. I think you're absolutely right. Um, when, when I speak in places, I often hear comments um, like yours from, from students with a charismatic or Pentecostal background um, who, who, who say this, this, there's so much in our own tradition that, op that, that, that would welcome um, what you're saying. Um, and I think the reason is that um, the Pentecostal and charismatic traditions are in some ways much more immune from the deleterious effects of modernity because they recognize that, that this world is charged with divine presence. Um, and so their experience of God's presence, their, their genuine experience of God's presence, of the telos already being here, mm -hmm. yes. um, 
is 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 uh, makes 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 students from a, from a Pentecostal or charismatic background often open to what it is um, that the tradition teaches on this point. Um, there, there's there's another aspect where I might have some questions, and that is particularly in terms of the authority of of tradition in setting certain parameters around things and and guiding us in this respect. So in in, in some sense, I think. Um, charismatic and, and Pentecostal um, believers sometimes run the danger of an individualized appropriation of the power of the spirit. Right? So ecclesiology, tradition, and so on are, are important, I think, to, to provide guidance here. But I want to affirm what you said about this. I think it's exactly right. Um, now, in terms of the question of, of, of playing off against each other, perhaps, as, as one of your instructors may, may have done, um, playing off against each other, analogia entis, analogy of being on the one hand and beatific vision on the other hand. Um, I, I would resist that. I would resist that. I would rather say that um, um, analogia entis um, enables us to truly appreciate um, created beauty for what it is. You need the doctrine of, of analogia entis to recognize the presence of God in this world. Um, when God reveals himself, he condescends, he accommodates himself. Uh, Sunkatabasis is the term that mm. Chrysostom often uses, you know, God, God uh, condescends, like he, he, he babbles, Calvin would say, he babbles like a father to his children, right? Um, and Thomas Aquinas, of course, it is an analogy of being. Um, when we say that um, God is beautiful, uh, we're, not, we're not saying that he is beautiful in the same manner um, that, that, that a landscape or mountain is, is, is beautiful. God is beautiful, we're not speaking falsely. Um, but God gives us language um, taken from this world um, to make such as be beauty, God, that God is beautiful, like a mountain is beautiful, or imposing, or God is like a rock, whatever sort of, sort of things you might want to talk about, whatever sort of images you might want to use. Um, God gives these to us in order that we may in some way be drawn into him. Um, the images are inadequate. Mm. The metaphors, the analogies, the, 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 um, whatever we say about God is always inadequate. It never quite matches up. Um, now, I'm not sure where your, where your instructor came from when he made his comment, but it is of course true that in the Western tradition, particularly in, in, in St. Thomas Aquinas and, and especially since about the 13th century, there's an emphasis on, in the Western tradition on us finally in the hereafter being able to see God's divine essence. Um, and um, depending on what you mean by that, the, let me put it this way, the way in which St. Thomas Aquinas and much of the Western tradition uh, following him understands that, um, it seems to me that it's better in that case to avoid the language of seeing the divine essence. Mm -hmm. um, it's not quite clear to me at least, I'm not a Thomist, but you know, it's not quite clear to me how one can combine um, seeing God face to face in the sense of seeing the divine essence itself right. beyond what we see of God in Jesus Christ. How to combine that with analogy of being. I'm much more comfortable with the Greek tradition where we will never see the essence of God, but we'll, we're taken up, taken up ever further into the energies of God. Now, whatever you may think of that distinction, um, personally, the way I do it in the book is somewhat different yet. And I, I basically talk about, we see God always in Christ. And that, of course, means if Christ is the Ur sacrament, the basic ultimate sacrament, then he is the uh, analogy of being incarnate. He is the analogy itself. 
so that in him, in Christ, um, um, the face of God is most fully revealed. And we never get past that. Christ is, in my understanding, the essence of God, the essence of God revealed. And the, the more deeply we enter into Christ, both here and in the hereafter, and I'm drawing here on St. Gregory of Nyssa, the more deeply we enter into God, into, in, in, into, into Christ, um, the more we come to know God's love and God's mercy in Christ, um, the better we understand and the more we come and fall in love with the essence of God. Um, and for great reasons, uh, that's a never ending journey, also in the year after. It's a never ending journey. Um, I, I, it's not like Thomas Aquinas is not attuned to the creator creature distinct, distinction. Um, but it just seems to me that the, some of the early fathers, especially the Greek fathers, um, uh, maybe articulate that a bit, a bit more carefully. And I don't know if that, that answers your question fully, but. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. And I got the chills, the Pentecostal chills just listening to it. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh... I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's a new word for me. And, 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 <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, <laughs> Professor Bursma, related to uh, what Oyan just asked you, uh, Ezra Iskander, who is your former uh, student, um, says, um, what, to what extent does Eastern Orthodox tradition shape your view yeah, of sacramentality? Interesting. Um, not, not so much directly. I mean, I suspect that indirectly, Alexander Schwiemann's book for the life of the world um, has influenced me, although, um, you know, I read it many years ago, but I don't know that it was a book that immediately deeply impacted me, although I love the book. Um, uh, it's not so much Eastern Orthodoxy as it is, I would say, the fathers and especially the Greek fathers. Um, and when I, when I wrote my book, Heavenly Participation, which is perhaps the book that most people read when they read something of me, um, when, when, when I wrote that book, I did not draw on Eastern Orthodox theology. I drew on 20th century Catholic theologians, on Nouvelle Theologie. And interestingly, the, the Nouvelle Theologians themselves drew both especially on the Greek fathers. Um, they were the ones that, that they translated and worked with especially. Um, and um, they were interested in Orthodox theology. Kungar was interested, for example, in dialogue with the Orthodox. Um, there is, I think, a desire, or was a desire on the part of Nouvelle Theology to go beyond medieval scholasticism. Uh, there was also an appropriation of Thomas, to be sure. But nonetheless, they wanted to go beyond medieval scholasticism to the earlier fathers in order to bring back together nature and the supernatural. The kind of bifurcation that I, th I think you begin to see somewhat already in Thomas Aquinas, but that you especially see later on in, in, in the late Middle Ages and, and in the subsequent period, that kind of a bifurcation of nature and the supernatural is just not there in the, in the Greek fathers. Um, so yeah, the influence was really Indirect, it was via via Nouvelle Theology and 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 via the early early uh, theologians, the early fathers, and not so much Eastern Orthodoxy. Although when Eastern Orthodox people read my book Heavenly Participation, they always wonder why I'm not Eastern Orthodox. Um, uh, and and it's true that I'm I'm probably um, theologically quite close and quite a, I feel quite akin to an orthodox spirituality and orthodox theology, yeah. Let me turn now to the folks in the studio. Uh, any one of you, Carmia or Abel or Atrianus? Uh, I want to uh, question. Uh, the thing you, 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 ha you have mentioned uh, about uh, inadequacy of analogy or metaphor, uh, while you say that, uh, you also argue that the term vision is more suitable to express the, the notion of union between the seer and the seen. Uh, but 
comparing this to uh, Jean-Luc Marion saturated phenomenon, uh, especially the ways in which human beings, we approach reality, Professor Marion said that uh, there is a possibility of uh, reducing the reality itself when we approach the reality with intention. Uh, through this, we remember uh, the, theory, the theory of intentionality by Edmund Husser. Um, the more we approach the reality with intention, the more reduction will happen. And uh, if we encounter the reality without any intention, we will receive a saturated phenomenon from the whole or namely uh, the total version of reality. So in my opinion, uh, this can be one of the inadequacy of the term vision. Because uh, we, when we imagine a picture, the, the form of or the anything related to vision, vision or a, vision about anything, about friendship, uh, eating ice cream or any form of enjoyment, we gain the risk of reduction from the its beatific uh, realities. So uh, why did you not choose embodiment rather than vision? Because in my view, embodiment can also emphasize the notion of union between us and the reality which we approach. Uh, how is your take on this? That's a great question. Uh, it's a broad question. Why not take embodiment? Um, um, one can. I mean, I, I, the term embodiment, I think, is, is a bit of an abstract term. It's, it's fine to use it depending on the context. But sexual union, I think, marital union, is, is, is a metaphor that scripture often uses. You think of the Song of Songs, basically from beginning to end. You know, you, you could understand the entire biblical, biblical narrative as, 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 as a... Um, as uh, an elaboration on God's pursuit of his bride and the bride's um, pursuit of the lover or sometimes turning away from the lover in, in sin. Um, so yeah, the, the uh, sexual union and knowledge of God um, through, through, through this thematic of, of, of marital union, of sexual union is I think important is there throughout the Christian tradition, particularly through allegorical interpretation of the Song of Songs. And I think it is, it is crucial. The notion of union with Christ or union with God, um, sexual imagery there, I think, is, is, is important. Um, when I, when I um, talk about um, vision being central, uh, I'm taking it as one of the five senses. And in the Christian Platonist tradition, vision is, is usually seen as the most significant, as the apex of, of, of the five senses. And uh, if, you've, if you've read carefully in the book, when I, when I highlight um, vision, I highlight it um, in order to... to, to um, exalted, as it were, above speech. Or I say speech, while certainly also it is important in scripture, um, perhaps through the Reformation in particular, um, it has been somewhat one-sidedly um, placed on a pedestal. Uh, the earlier Christian Platonist tradition saw vision as crucially important. Um, and, um, and the reason is precisely the one that you indicate in your question, namely that vision has to do with union, just as sexual union speaks of, of the union to husband and wife. So vision, according to the earlier Platonist tradition at least, unites the subject with the object, um, something that, that hearing or speech and hearing um, doesn't quite do. Um, now, the question of, of intentionality, I think, is, is a difficult one, but it seems to me that you cannot do without intentionality. Um, 
uh, also in connection with embodiment, if you pick it as a theme or, or sexual union more specifically, uh, if you pick it, pick it as, a, as a theme through which, a lens through which to, to understand the God-creature relationship, um, you're, you're still imposing um, an, uh, a certain intentionality. It seems to me not only that you cannot get away from it, but you probably shouldn't get away from it. Um, if it's true that creative things have a natural end and uh, have an appetite toward that end, and that human beings have a rational appetite toward that end, then it seems to me that in our hermeneutic, um, we have to be in line with the telos for which something is made. Um, now, do we make mistakes in that? Uh, are we always, do we always only have a uh, very limited perspective on that telos and so on, so that there is a skewing of things and, 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 and a limiting of things due to our, both our creatureliness and our sinfulness? Yes, absolutely. Um, but we cannot do without such a pre-understanding, I think, and without imposing some sort of intentionality. And, and it is that intentionality that makes understanding possible. Um, it is true that the phenomenon is infinitely saturated precisely because it is linked to divine ideas. It, it, it is patterned on God, it is sacramental in character. So yeah, the, the phenomena around us, the appearances around us uh, are, are saturated infinitely. Um, and it's possible to treat them as idols instead of as icons, yes, by imposing and, 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 and violating their integrity. But if we treat them in line with the telos for which they're made, or to the degree that we do that, uh, we're not violating, I think, um, their, 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 their reality to which they point and that they make present. Um, we're, we're, we're interpreting it in line with that reality. Um, without such boldness, hermeneutical boldness, I, I just don't see how you, engage, how you can engage with the world. Does that help someone? Feel free to follow up. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I just wonder, uh, uh, any occasion when we uh, encounter with something that surprise us. That means uh, we approach the beatific realities uh, unintentionally. So right. I just wonder how, I just wonder, uh, can we approach something unintentionally? Uh, and through that, uh, we, 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 we encounter the, uh, the beatific uh, reality uh, when, when, I, when I change the term. Yeah, let me simply affirm what I think lies behind your question, that yes, we can be surprised and God often surprises us yeah. and we have to be open to surprises. Um, um, the great sin of modernity, I think, is, 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 is that of, um, considering that human intentionality um, is a full and adequate grasp of the world around us. And I think that is what Marion protests against um, with him in the protest. Um, and therefore we need to be open to surprises because when you say something to me, you're, you're, you're showing me sides of, of, of a topic that I haven't seen and vice versa. And so it's in our encounter and in our discussion together uh, that I am being surprised and that hopefully you're being surprised. And then I'm thinking, oh, but what about X? Right? What about Y? Um, so it's not like that I'm coming without intentions. Um, I'm coming with intentions, but I think I need to be willing for those intentions to be reshaped and for those intentions to be redirected. Um, 
so yes, there are surprises, absolutely. And, and, and that's, I think, what undergirds Anselm's entire proslogium, that he longs from, for seeing God better and more, for, 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 for divine revelation to, to saturate him, as it were. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful answer. Very welcome. Carmia? Yeah, my question is quite a pastoral question. Um, and it's uh, related to what uh, my friend Abel has posted. How then we shall see the beauty of God in this broken reality? Or put it positively, how this sacramental ontology can work and help us to live hopefully and faithfully in this broken reality, in the midst of crisis. And, 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 and how can we achieve, quote-unquote, the telos expected, the expected telos? Um, because if, if, as you mentioned in your book, that uh, this beatific vision is... Uh, can 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 work to make us happy, a uh, happy making God. This secular world also over us with some kind of, um, let's say moral moralistic therapeutic deism and so on and so on like that. It also make us happy. So how can we achieve quote unquote the expected telos in right. this broken yeah. reality? Thank you for that. Um, the worst thing to do seems to me, is to deny the brokenness that you're mentioning in your question. Um, it simply won't do to say, um, if only you look better, more clearly, you'll see that everything fits together just perfectly. Because everything does not fit together perfectly due to the results of sin. Um, so the, the brokenness of the world is real. And the doctrine of the beauty of vision is not meant to paper over the hardships and the suffering and the brokenness that people experience in this life. Um, now, the interesting thing is that it is precisely in periods and in, in parts of the world where there is perhaps more intense suffering um, than in um, rich parts and rich parts of the world. It's in it's in in, in periods of suffering and in, in 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 times of poverty, and it is in parts of the world where there is a great deal of of hardship. It's often there that Christian Platonism um, finds fertile root. Uh, the modern West. Um, since the 17th, 18th centuries um, has not been particularly enamored with the beatific vision. And I think that the reason is that we take this worldly goods, the pleasure of this worldly goods as um, beatifying. And when you're experiencing misery, hardship, suffering, um, you're going to say to yourself, or you're more likely to say to yourself, there's got to be something more than this. There's got to be something more than this. And the gospel teaches us that that is exactly right. There is something more than this. There is an quote unquote otherworldly reality that is waiting for us. Um, in the book, I try to um, walk a tightrope, as it were between, on the one hand, um, saying the vision of God is something we already experience here now. It's already here because of the natural desire, because of the linking of nature and the supernatural, etc. That on the one hand. And on the other hand, also recognizing but this promise of 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 13, verse 12, that we will see God face to face means that is um, that God holds out something to us that we do not yet experience 
at least not in the same manner or to the same fullness. Um, and so the beatific vision, I think, um, does two things. In line with the, on the one hand, what it does is it opens our eyes, hopefully, as Christians. It opens our eyes to the many good things, the many good gifts that God gives us and in which we see him present. In the midst of our difficulties, sufferings, hardships, hopefully we will have the faith to say, and yet I see God. He is not far from me. And, and this is in line with the only other hand, at the same time what the doctrine of the beauty of vision does, I think, is, is to say to us, um, um, the redemption that Christ has wrought um, is only partially here. And, and we are going to be taken up in him in a way that we are not yet today. So that the beautiful vision, the happiness uh, that you mentioned in your question, the happiness of the, of the beautiful vision is something that will in no way be lacking when we see God in Christ in the hereafter. So those two things together, it seems to me, we all need to have that, but especially when, when we're in, hard, in periods of hardship or whatever kind of suffering we're experiencing. Um, think of one adventure. I had, I had a student do a thesis on, on on several of uh, Bonaventure's um, meditations. And um, he writes a lot about suffering. And in the midst of his suffering, he always points to Jesus Christ and to the answer that Jesus Christ provides. And it seems to me that we can't do any less today. Thank you. Professor Bursma, there is a question from Liverpool 9 fan. Uh, do you think modern Christians have misunderstood the meaning of participation for Owen Barfield? Pre-thinking state of consciousness is crucial to be able to proper participation. Yes. By the way, can I add a question? Because I think it's related to this question, Professor Bursma. So what I want to ask, I think when we talk about participation, uh, it's very close to the concept with Neoplatonism, I guess. And when we talk about Neoplatonism, I guess it's very, and we talk about the God and the world relationship, I guess it's uh, more close to panentheism, I guess. So so what, what I want to ask uh, is when we talk about like sacramental ontology, is panentheism more preferable? I mean, rather than classical theism or not? Yeah, I think it's related with this question. I just wondering. Yes, it is. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, Owen Barfield wants to save the appearances. Um, and um, I'm very much with Owen Barfield on, in his recognition that it is not just um, rational thought that, um, that allows us to, to participate in the life of God. Um, in fact, our, our rational thoughts, I think, often follow our imagination. The imagination, I think, is underappreciated. Um, and the romantics, I think, were generally right in um, insisting that um, there is something pre-thinking, um, a, a mode of apprehending reality that does not, that does not um, simply come as the result of, of rational, analytical uh, modes of, 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 of apprehending reality. Um, as to how this, or how this ties in with participation, and the question that you're raising about, about panentheism. Um, I'm always a little nervous when the topic comes up um, because when you affirm panentheism, people immediately think Hegel and think of, uh, of a mixing of, of, 
of, of God becoming through the historical processes of this world and so on. And um, I, I don't want to go there. Um, but it is true, I think, that the entire pre-modern tradition had a way of understanding that um, we would, we, we, that, that, that we, most of us today would simply classify as panentheist. And with that, I mean, everything is in God. I'm not saying, I'm not denying divine transcendence of this. What, what, what modernity does when it veers to panentheism, it immanentizes God and it tends to obscure his transcendence. It, it basically mixes God with creation so that God becomes part and parcel of the world of becoming. Um, we see that in, in, in 19th century uh, Hegelianism. We see that in 20th century process thought. Um, but the great tradition speaks as strongly about God's presence in this world, or rather our presence in God, as these modern thinkers, as do these modern thinkers, without, however, losing sight of divine transcendence. There's an apophatic side to the great tradition that safeguards divine transcendence. It seems to me that you cannot and should not shy away from panentheism, properly understood. Namely, um, God stoops down in Jesus Christ without losing, in, and that is to say, he takes on human flesh, he assumes human flesh without um, losing his divine transcendence. And that combination of transcendence and immanence, I think, is 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 important over against a a view of God as a being in the clouds, as it were, or God who is above the clouds as a be one being among many beings. I worry that. Sometimes when I hear objections to panentheism, that what people are really after is a mythological understanding of a God out there as a being um, who's separate from this world. Uh, such a view of God was not the view of the great tradition of the church. I've tried to combine the two questions somewhat, um, but... Gave my best thought. Yeah, thank you very much. Ah, by the way, the context of my question is because my discussion with Nindio last year. So <laughs> at that time, we discussed about beauty. And I think the apex of our discussion was about the relationship between God and world. And at the time, I hold the classical theism and Nindio used, he always teased me with panentheism like that. So, so <laughs> but. Yeah, and the, the more I learn today, I mean, I know learn Jurgen Jurgen Moltmann like that. I think yeah, it's interesting. That's why, that's 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 why that's. I mean that that's intrigued me to yeah, yeah. ask that question. So I mean, you you won. Okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> you I, I wouldn't necessarily go. With, I wouldn't necessarily go with money and view of this, um, but but you know you could read Maximus the Confessor, and I think you get an awesome understanding of the, of the creator creature relationship. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. A question from Stephen. Uh, in regards to Christian Platonism, what is the most common misconception that you come across when discussing writers such as Origen, who was influenced by Plato or Plotinus? Um, most common misconception is perhaps that um, origin um, through his reading of Philo uh, was wholly indebted to Middle Platonism. And um, for that reason, and because of his other uh, theological speculations as well, or his other metaphysical speculations as well, cannot be classified as a Christian theologian. That's, I think, the most common misconception. It does origin great injustice, I think, 
um, and it is based on a very narrow reading of origin, origins first principles, um, apart from his biblical commentaries, and uh, a reading of origin that reads him through the lens of later originism, which Maximus often attacks and, and attempts to discredit, and rightly so. Um, in other words, um, we, we, when we're afraid of the Hellenization of Christianity, uh, we, we look at origin as the black sheep, as the one who introduces has introduced to the Christian tradition much of this Hellenization of, of the faith. It is Origen who has um, um, uh, failed, basically, has failed to read the scriptures uh, Christologically. It is Origen who has failed to um, um, take divine revelation as central to his theology. And it is Origen who has a far too optimistic view of what it is that humans are able, able to come up with by means of human reason, uh, and in particular by way of borrowing from, from the Platonic tradition. Um, I think uh, it's Robert Wilkin who in his uh, great book on, on seeking the face of God, I think it's called, if I remember well, um, uh, makes the comment that it, it's time for us to put aside the unhelpful notion of, uh, of uh, the Hellenization of, of Christianity and begin instead to speak of the Christianization of Hellenism. Something to that effect. I may, I may not quote him exactly, but he, he says something like that. And I think that's right. Um, did Origen read Philo? Yes. Um, does he rely on Philo? Yes. Does he allegorize like Philo allegorizes? Yes. Um, what motivates Origen to do this? Um, it's his Christian convictions. In other words, Origen was first a theologian, and first a Christian thinker, before he started borrowing from elements of the Platonic tradition. Um, there are reasons, I think, why Origen and the early church more broadly is open to, um, to the Platonic tradition. What allegorizing did for, or for Origen is it allowed him to read the scriptures Christologically. Um, Origen wanted to read the scriptures sacramentally. He wanted to find Christ in the Old Testament scriptures. And therefore, he allegorized them. Now, does that mean that we have to read the scriptures in the exact same way that Origen did and allegorize in the exact same manner that he did? No, I don't think so. And I don't think Origen would expect us necessarily to do that uh, because he didn't believe that there was just one right interpretation of any given biblical text. But what he would want us to do is to adopt the kind of sacramental sensibility that he has, to adopt the kind of participatory metaphysic that he has, um, at one point in his in his commentary on the Song of Songs, he has has an extended, a fairly extended defense of allegorizing. And what he does is, before he, talk, he talks about allegorizing at all, he, he he has an extended section on on metaphysics and talks about the relationship between this worldly things and otherworldly things. <laughs> How they, how, how we are, how we are to understand that relationship, and then he, one, only once he has done that, and he explains, of course, he explains this all, of course, in a, in a thoroughly participatory manner. <laughs> only once he has done that does he then talk about the relationship between Old and New Testaments, or rather, between the Old Testament and the Christological fulfillment. Um, I think to look back in history and spirit. I mean, he, he he really, his book on origin is really the answer to the charge of, of Hansen and, and, and others, and even Daniel Liu, the Lubach student. Yeah. Um, the Lubach's book, History and Spirit, is the answer, I think, to these kind of common charges that origin would be an unreconstructed um, uh, Middle Platonist. Um, origin, I think, is a biblical theologian through and through. Um, 
does he use metaphysical, platonic um, frameworks, um, uh, modes of exegesis, all of this? Yes, he does. He does. Um, but I think we might want, just want to ask the question whether it is possible for us today to read the scriptures fruitfully, that is to say, with proper use, as Gregory Mesa would put it, proper of Ophelia, usefulness, um, without such a framework. Um, and my submission would be that, no, you can't do it. Well, I think, thank you. Uh, the time is almost up, but if you can still have uh, some minutes with us, Professor Pursma, there is one last question, I think, from uh, Chandra Wim, from Professor Wim. Um, My thesis advisor as well. <laughs> okay, yeah, and, and <laughs> great. And he is asking you uh, two questions, but I think this is a more interesting question. So let me put the second question first from uh, Mr. Wim. Uh, can one affirm, if not most, of your conclusion on sacramental participation and beatific vision uh, without neoplatonic metaphysics? Um, well, I, let me put it this way. Um, if, if you do affirm all, perhaps most, at least most, of my conclusions on sacramental participation and beatific vision, without any platonic baggage, go for it. I mean, you know, um, toss Plato in the garbage can, Plotinus as well, and read scripture um, the way that I'm advocating advocating in, uh, in my book, Scripture as Real Presence, and the way that I'm advocating in my book, Seeing God. I mean, that's what it's about theologically, after all. And I've insisted already earlier in my defense of origin that's what drove origin and that's what drives my thinking for sure the christological and the theological presuppositions of all of this not plato or plotinus primarily now having said that it, 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 it i get this question i get asked this question often and it, it it remains a puzzle to me why someone would want to accept everything i'm saying about sacramental ontology and, and everything else beatific vision in this sacramental participatory manner, and then throw out Plotinus and Plato, especially Plotinus, who gives us Methexus participation, and 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 who gives us who gives us much of a framework to articulate this metaphysically. Mm. Now, it is important to 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 uphold Scripture as as the primary authority, of course and to begin with Christology and with theology and not with Plato. In that sense, we can't simply be a Platonist and a Christian at the same time. You can't be a pagan and a Christian at the same time. You must be a Christian. But, but there is every reason of why the early fathers and the subsequent tradition were so enamored with elements, not with everything, but with elements of Neoplatonism um, and that, and 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 the and and the the question, the one who the, the person asking the question, already gives me gives the reasons for it. The reasons are that they want to articulate a way of doing exegesis, that they want to articulate an understanding of the creator creature relationship, that they want to understand an understanding of the telos that is participatory in character, and and if you don't use Platonic tools, what else are you going to use for it? Um, you're going to need some kind of metaphysic to articulate this. Um, and 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 uh, I, I just don't know how else you would do it. <laughs> and one more comment about this, maybe. And that is, undergirding this question, sometimes, I, I'm not sure, I'm, I, I've met the questioner, I think, once upon a time in 2015 at Wycliffe, but I don't really recall who he is, I'm afraid. But sometimes the, the background to this question is all we need is the Bible. And we don't need anything else. We don't need the tradition that, that, to govern our interpretation of the scriptures. 
And I think that's where sometimes the nervousness, especially among evangelicals, it's where sometimes the nervousness comes about this Platonist bit of things. And, and what I would say to that is you cannot uphold the authority of scripture, which is so dear to you. You cannot uphold it without also accepting the tradition and the trajectory that the tradition has taken over time. Um, in interpreting those scriptures. Um, the tradition is authoritative. Mm. And uh, the tradition has taken, as Josef Ratzinger puts it well, has, has taken the trajectory of, of these two streams, the Greek tradition and the biblical tradition coming together. And it's this, this synthesis in the Christian faith um, that is that we, we can't go back on. It's not as if I am just receiving the scriptures today, reading the Bible for the first time and trying to make sense of it for, for the first time and doing this by myself. No, I, I can only do that by faithfully standing within the tradition mm -hmm. um, that has handed to me these scriptures. And I think the first question can be a great uh and for the session for today. And, and can I add to that question, which is related? Uh, sure. What do you, what, what also do you, because it's uh, the opposite direction of the question that is posed, uh, what do you say to people who say that what you're doing because you're coming from a Christian reform background uh, doesn't um, elucidate uh, reform theology, it actually obscures and deny them at some, like some of uh, the uh, re uh, reviewers uh, says of your book. Right, right, right. Um, sorry, I, I, I was kind of distracted here by something else. Oyan, can you just repeat that part of the question? Yeah, so uh, the question that was asked to you is often asked uh, at Regent College, I remember that. And so um, on the opposite um, side of that question, sometimes they say that, what you are doing does not elucidate um, your uh, background from uh, reform theology. It actually obscures and denies some of the tenets of reform theology. So, right, right, uh, right, yeah, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, full disclosure. Um, uh, we became my wife and I became Anglican about three years ago, um, and it has everything to do with the journey that I, I have undertaken. I grew up reform Calvinist. And it is true, I think, that journey that I have taken theologically um, is, is not ultimately compatible with Calvinism. It's not. Um, and I can understand why the questioner would say, well, aren't you Roman Catholic? Uh, I can't say I've never been tempted by that. I have been tempted by that. Um, and it is also true that in my, in my book, Heavenly Participation, in the second part, I draw uh, a great deal on the Nouvelle theologians uh, for a reconfiguring of the nature of supernatural uh, relationship. Um, however, um, I cannot, for theological reasons, become Roman Catholic, and I'm 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 not Roman Catholic, for 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 several reasons. Um, earlier on in our discussion, uh, the question of of Eastern Orthodoxy came up, and I already mentioned that I'm actually very sympathetic to much uh, to 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 the Eastern Orthodox approach, as in many ways I think faithfully continuing um, the Greek patristic approach, a theological approach. Um, um, the way I read Roman Catholicism, although I'm, I'm very sympathetic with much Roman Catholicism, with much of Roman Catholicism, um, I have many Roman Catholic friends. Uh, some of my children actually are Roman Catholic. So I have, I have lots of sympathies with Catholicism. Um, but the way that I, uh, that I understand the relationship between the sacramentum and the race, sacrament and the reality, 
means that it is always only participatory. Um, in terms of, of the language of my book, we see only something of God today. And that also holds for the church and her articulation of doctrine, I think. Um, the way in which the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church lays claim to um, authority um, is I think out of line since the 19th century at least, it is out of line with the way in which the earlier tradition understood authority to function. In particular, the way in which infallibility functions within Roman Catholicism. I mean, in some sense, the church is infallible in the sense that God infallibly leads us as his people to the end. But, but the way in which infallibility functions in the, in the Roman Catholic Church uh, does not allow, I think, Rome ever to get back on earlier decisions. It is in, it is in that sense irreformable in, in an important sense, I think. And um, I don't think that in the fourth century, for example, uh, when certain conciliar decisions were made, these conciliar decisions were taken at face value as infallible or as absolutely authoritative. Um, they had to be received. There was a reception process. And that reception could go either way in principle. It's not like the church is expected to be skeptical towards councils, but um, it takes time, I think, for the spirit to work in the church and for the church to discern the viability, the wisdom, the truthfulness of particular decisions. Um, and in particular, the juridical way in which the Roman Catholic Church articulates um, papal infallibility since the 19th century. Um, I don't think it's in line with the earlier tradition. Um, and that, that has to do, I think, with, with a view in which one gets the sense, I think, that in Roman Catholicism, the reality is so fully there already. And that the church, forgive me the language, but is almost seems almost in control of divine grace. That of course is Bart's great objection to Rome. And I think Bart of that point at least was right in his objection. Um, I think the church needs a more tentative stance than Rome can, can, can afford, I think, or has been able to afford since the 19th century. Um, that said, that said, um, in many ways, the Roman Catholic Church is far more sacramental in its approach uh, than most of Protestantism. It retains a sense of authority. It retains a sense of doctrine, <laughs> doctrinal cohesion. Um, it, it, it retains a sense of the importance of tradition, uh, of the liturgy, all of these things. Um, that are all up for grabs within most of Protestantism. Um, so the critical comments that I made simply explain why I'm not Catholic. They're not a wholesale denunciation of Rome. I think this is the perfect way to end the session. And thank you very much again, Dr. Bursma, for your time and for your yes. being with us. This is such an enlightening moment for us and uh, a kind of moment for seeing God again. Well, thank you very much, India. <laughs> yeah, agree, agree. You gotta give an amen. <laughs> again, really. can, I, can, I, can I mention again uh, uh, what I'm, uh, I was uh, telling to uh, Professor Busma? So uh, uh, when I uh, read on uh, uh, his book, uh, Sacramental Ontology, he said in the uh, uh, preface that uh, when he took sabbatical uh, year, he, he, he used the entire year to uh, read uh, resource more. And after that, he continued to uh, produce and to research to write a more fascinating uh, 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 production or, or writings and until he, he, he published this book. So I think we all 
have to consider to take a sabbatical <laughs> and this is important for us <laughs> to, to create more <laughs> thoughts <laughs> great thank idea Abel. yeah yeah great great idea thank you great for idea. underlining <laughs> that <laughs> thank you so much all right folks thank you for your time and we'll see you again uh, for the next uh, session bye bye thank you very much for having thank me much. thank you professor Bruce. Thank you. Thank you.